Good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Uh, we had a small group Friday night that was able to go to Unite Midwest and participate. Um, it was a gathering of different churches across the Midwest, across Iowa, um, from I think Pella to around Des Moines. Um, and there was a time of praise and worship. There was a group of worship leaders from around the city that kind of opened, and then there was people from Bethel worship that we do some of their music here, some of the songs from Bethel out of Reading, Colorado, Bill Johnson's ministry, and it was a beautiful time of worship. And before we even started, Sarah and I were shopping for t-shirts and getting pretzels and whatever we were doing, killing some time. We got there early so we could get good seats. And um, we happened upon a booth um, from a woman who's just starting a ministry in Des Moines, and it's called Garden Gate Ranch Ministries. And her logo, Sarah's like, oh, that's a dove. And she said, and so we were talking to this woman about her ministry, her vision for this ranch. And Sarah looks over, she goes, that dove is holding broken chains in its talons. And I was struck because their logo, and you can't really see this, but it's a gate. And what's the name of our prayer ministry here? Eastern Gate House of Prayer. So it felt like one of those divine appointments where we were supposed to meet this woman. Her name's Brenda Long. She's in the process of acquiring property to start a, a ranch to rehabilitate women who have been stuck in slave traffic, like slave trafficking, um, human trafficking, and prostitution out, and so that a safe place where they can come be rehabilitated and keep their children. Most places that offer rehabilitation do not allow these women to bring their children, and the children become separated from the mothers. And so part of her ministry is to teach these women how to be mothers, how to be godly mothers and how to also you know find their place in the world and so she has a vision they'll have horses equine ministry they'll have gardens raise their own food um anyway it was just a divine appointment and um, we were very blessed to talk to brenda long is her name i would just ask that we start praying as a body sarah and i felt very drawn to her ministry we wrote ourselves down for volunteers and i have a feeling there'll be something with our women's ministry here um connecting us to this ministry um and then the other thing I wanted to talk about, so, so people are people, right? God has no favorites. These people from Bethel have amazing voices. They're worshipers, but they're no different than any of us. Nope, they're no right. different from any of us. They love the Lord just like we love the Lord. They may be a little more comfortable in expressing it. They may have been dancing. This woman, um, uh, Christine, she was pregnant. She was very pregnant. <laughs> did not stop her from worshiping. Did not stop her from spinning and dancing. And I was really moved by their worship. And at one point, I noticed in the very beginning, I don't know if anybody else noticed this, but when she was worshiping, she was going like this in her worship. And I thought, that's right, woman. You pound on those gates. You pound on those doors. And in her, in her kind of spontaneous worship, she was praying. She was talking about the ancient gates and those ancient doors. And there's some seeds that have been planted in Des Moines that have been forgotten about. And I felt very strongly that she sensed those things, and she was trying to press through, and she was talking about, she, and it's so funny because it's what we've been talking about here. She's like, just let it out. The, the living water, just let it out. And she was just not going to give up until something happened. And it was just a reminder to us that sometimes, sometimes it's not just, thank you, Jesus, hallelujah, and the goosebumps. Sometimes it's let's get busy. Let's, get, let's, 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 let's break some things down. Let's open those doors. Let's open those ancient gates and the things that are hidden. Sometimes we have to fight for it. Right. Sometimes we have to, to focus on it and want it. Yeah. And I felt like she wanted something on Friday night, and she got it. Yeah. And it was just a testimony, to re and, and just to, to the Lord brought it to my remembrance that sometimes, sometimes, it's work, right? Yeah. Sometimes we have to want it. Anyway, so... All of this led me back to Psalm 24, which I'm sure is a familiar psalm for most people, but it's a psalm of David. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall descend into the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from God, from the God of his salvation. The good news is we have already received that. We already have access. And because of that, what, is the, what does verse 6 tell us? This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Salah. Lift up your heads, O you gates. 
and be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Now, I was struck, lift up your heads, O ye gates. Since when does a gate have a head? We have heads. We are to lift up our heads, right? We are to lift up our heads and look up, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors. We are the doors. Our mouth, right? Open it up. And when we lift up our heads and when we open up our mouths and when we praise and when we worship, the king of glory shall come in. And who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. How many of us are going through battles right now? Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Salah. Who is the king of glory? Who is the king of glory? Who is the king of glory in our hearts and in our minds? Do we expect him to come? Do we seek for him to come every time we gather together? Every time we seek our prayer closet? Every time that we turn our eyes to him? Do we expect that when we open up, when we lift our eyes, when we open our mouths, do we expect the king of glory to come in? We should. We should. We have been blessed. We are anointed. We are covered. We are righteous. We are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so I just, I just want to encourage all of you to expect the king of glory to come in. Open, we lift up our heads. We, if we open up our mouths. And the king of glory shall come in in Jesus' name. Glory. Yes. Glory. Amen. Glory. Glory. Amen. Glory. And uh, one of the other things that struck me that just brought back to mention is one of the, uh, the like spontaneous worship times, she said our, our worship is a weapon. And I just, and what struck me after this is a battering ram. Our worship is a battering ram on those gates, and they cannot withhold the blessings that the Lord has for us. In Jesus' name. Any uh, prayer requests or any testimonies this morning? Yeah, Gene. else this morning prayer requests or word for the lord testimony all right well let's stand and go to the lord <clears throat> heavenly father we thank you lord you bring these memorials to our remembrance lord that these the seeds that have been planted in this soil lord the promises for this city lord the promises for our lives for this body abundant life we thank you lord that you bring those to remembrance lord that you open those ancient gates lord when you open it, Lord, no man can shut it. We thank you, Lord, for divine appointments, Lord. We lift up this Garden Gate Ranch to you, Lord, as Brenda and her team are following after your vision, Lord. We thank you for a heart of ministry that will care for the women lost, the women that need help more than any, Lord. And we come to you this morning. We gather together in your house, in this house, a house of prayer, Lord 
to lift you up and magnify you, to join together in worship and praise, to, to be hearers of your word, Lord, so that we can go out and be doers of your word. So we thank you, Lord, that when we gather together, Lord, that we are encouraged, Lord, that we, that we leave this place transformed, Lord, as you renew our mind by the hearing of your word, Lord. And right now, Lord, we speak to the north and the south and the east and the west, and we ask you, for those who are not here, Lord, bless them this morning. Let them know that they are missed, Lord, and draw those who have yet to find this house, those who are called to this place and this ministry, Lord. Draw them in by your Holy Spirit, Lord. And help us to be aware, Lord, as we walk through each day of those divine appointments, Lord. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear and be sensitive to your Holy Spirit. Lift up your name, Jesus, in this house. It's all about you, Lord. It's all for your glory of your kingdom, Lord. And this morning we ask that your kingdom come. Meet with us this morning, Lord, as we lift you up and we praise you. In Jesus' name. anybody has ears to hear, I pray that you just speak it forth this morning. The Lord wants to talk to us, and I'm not the mouthpiece this morning, but I know that there's something he wants to say to us this morning, so I ask that you be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and share whatever the Lord puts on your heart this morning. In Jesus' name, all right. Uh, just a reminder, if you brought a cell phone today, to turn them off or silent them. And financial peace, Roberto, if you want to share a little bit about that. Yes, start the week with tomorrow. Woo-hoo. <laughs> Very excited. Uh, we have four families so far. Uh, I have an extra day to share it because I'm in the business trip. Best Friday night of the month, August 11th. Yeah, we're going to be open one more day. Um, I know that this team, this, this prayer team, and those that have been involved in with it, uh, what's eased and what has transpired has come up to help implement the United Way web and the, the, the event at the uh, event center downtown. Uh, I know for a fact the Lord has used your faithfulness of praying here in Des Moines? Yes, they are. Okay. And they have fellowship, like, kind of like we did, used to do, I think, like once a month. They go to different churches and have fellowship and singing and praise and worship and services because, you know, we're looking for other churches to come and join us. She's a black lady, so I'm sure they're, <laughs> uh, they, they're exuberant in their worship <laughs> because she's an exuberant person, I'm sure. <laughs> Not that we're all, no offense taken, I hope. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what we say that. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, Roberto and James, you two want to come take the offering this morning? Roberto, you want to ask a blessing? on the Lord as the worship team finishes doing the offering. I know, I just realized we're doing this. <laughs> and I think was, somebody has not paid their shares. Yeah, so we just wait upon the Lord. We wear it out on our days with the help of God. We got shares ready for the show. Our stand next to me by the keyboard. And in time, she will start singing.
set their hearts on fire. We are Christians, which means we are Christ-like, which means we were created to be just like Christ. Stop accepting imitations and be Him. Be His love. Spread it everywhere you go and light that fire.
Hallelujah. Let's give God the glory right now. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Glory to God. Lord, we bless your name. We praise you this morning. Hallelujah. You are a great and a mighty God, and there's none like you, Lord. You alone are God. Hallelujah. And nothing is impossible with you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise God. We bless you this morning, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. We bless the name. Baruch Hashem. We bless the name. Hallelujah. The name that is above every name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for giving us your name, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise God. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Praise God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, Mike, and the worship team. Great job. Appreciate you being sensitive to the Holy Spirit this morning. Amen. Sunday school young people may be dismissed. Thank the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The devil's a liar. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. He, uh, he likes to come in confusion. Praise the Lord. But God is not the author of confusion, praise the Lord, but peace, love, joy, and a sound mind, hallelujah, and uh, praise the Lord, we claim that in Jesus' name, and we just rebuke every lie of the enemy, and uh, just declare that God has his way, because he does. I thought when Sarah was sharing the Holy Ghost with us. Our God is a consuming fire. Praise the Lord. He is a consuming fire. And on the day of the resurrection, Jesus was walking and two disciples met him along the way, not recognizing him in the natural. But they said, didn't our hearts burn within us as he opened the scriptures to us? Praise the Lord. Our God is a consuming fire. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You know, last Sunday we were talking about finding ourselves in Scripture the way Jesus did and uh, reading the Scripture as though <coughs> it's written personally to us. And it is. And it's revelation. And it's more than information. It's alive. It's a living document. Praise the Lord. It's not just words on a page. It literally is life itself. And, and we, need to, we, need to, we need to look at it that way. God's wanting to do something dramatic in this last day. And this is the last day because it's our opportunity to make it the last day. If it's not the last day, then the last day will come for somebody else. Praise the Lord. It's up to us, amen, to make it a reality. And so with that in mind, I, wanna, I don't want to just meander around here for too long, so we'll just get right to the, to the message, and then I can meander. Praise the Lord. But I'd like to start with uh, Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. See, it's not enough just to find yourself in the Scripture. You've got to believe it after you find it. Praise the Lord. He has given us His name. That means we're His. We're His children. Just like, just like your parents gave you their name. Amen. Our Father gave us His name. Amen. We are all Jesus. Praise the Lord. We're all part of the family of God. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 15, verse 5 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. That's right here. That we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, 
might have hope. The biggest weapon, one of the biggest weapons that the enemy has uh, that he uses against us is time. Praise the Lord. Because when things don't happen immediately the way you think they ought to happen, the way you've been praying, the way you've been believing, then, then you start doubting God. You start questioning what the Word of God says. And I perceive, and this isn't some real in-depth perception, but talk to people and they tell you things are bad and I'm just here, I'm just making it. I don't need to do, use a lot of discernment to realize that the enemy is messing with people. And we're letting him because we're saying what he says. We're saying what he says to us. Now, I'm not, I don't want to be, I don't want to be a jerk. You know, I don't want to be hard. But, you know, at some point, we've got to grow up. At some point, we've got to start doing, you know, we're talking about worship. And, hey, I, I get it, you know. But well, you can't just do that in a two-hour service. You, you've got to live your life that way. You've got to be disciplined enough to know that when crap comes, you're the one that has to fend it off. Amen. And the only way you can do that is by the Word of God. If you don't believe this, you're already screwed. Pardon my vernacular. I'm just saying you're already in a mess. Praise the Lord. Because there isn't someplace else to go. If you don't believe this, you better hope for all kinds of good luck and, you know, you know, people to just really be kind to you and all of that kind of stuff. And that just doesn't work out that well. Because people can be complete idiots. <laughs> can I get a witness? Hallelujah. Some, somebody, you know, you're dealing with people. And you can't depend on people. Amen. I want to be dependable, but I'm not, I'm not putting my confidence in somebody else. I'm putting my confidence in God and His Word because that's the only thing I know that's for sure. That's the thing I know is not going to change. People's feelings towards me and their situations, they can change, you know, multiple times in a day. This will not change. And unless we get this established in us, we are at the mercy, not only of the devil, but of the world itself, just anybody. And, you know, sometimes, you know, I've, I've, I've dealt with people a lot over the years. And this is, it's not to say that I don't have compassion or that I don't care, but some people would rather have sympathy than deliverance. Yeah, you can say amen or oh man, but that's the fact. And you know it as well as I do. There are some people, no matter what you do, they're not going to get delivered because they like, they like the attention, they like the sympathy, they like the pity more than they really want to be delivered from their mess. I'll never forget, I hadn't been, uh, I'd been assistant to the pastor, and we were in a large church in East Texas, and uh, I hadn't been involved in this very long. In fact, I'd only been saved about three years. And I'd been involved in all kinds of bus ministry and uh, junior high teaching and, and, and the youth groups and, uh, and ministering, you know, in the pulpit and so forth. But, uh, and all kinds of outreaches that we were involved in. And I, and I believed in the supernatural. I believed in the miracles. I'd experienced it. I mean, my life was a total mess. I had been a, a drug addict, a heroin addict, uh, Alcohol, and I mean, that was my life from the time I got out of the military until I was saved. And I saw the transition. I saw the, the effect of the Holy Spirit and what God can do in a person's life. Does that mean I'm perfect? By no means does that mean I'm perfect. But I knew what deliverance was. I knew what God was capable of because I had experienced it myself. And we were in, a, in a, just a typical, I think it was a Sunday service, and uh, several people came forward for prayer. And... Uh, pastor prayed for him, and as we were walking back to his office, he said, she's not going to get healed. And I thought, <laughs> probably not. I mean, if, you don't, if you're the one praying for her, if you don't believe it, what is this all about? And he said, because as quickly as God heals her, she's going to find something else to be troubled with, something else to be sick about, because she just wants attention. 
She wants sympathy. She wants people to feel sorry for her. Praise the Lord. I'm not, t- I'm not saying that to anybody here. I'm just saying sometimes we forget that we have authority. And the stuff that comes out of our mouth determines a lot of what our life is about. And if you can't, de- if you can't discipline this member, you're going to have problems forever. You can just quote me on that because I've had a trouble with this thing before. I mean, I know when to shut up. I just don't always do it. And I found over the years, man, the less said the better in most situations. That doesn't mean I'm always good at that. I'm just saying when I can't, when I can't see the miracle, when I can't feel the miracle that I'm praying for, that I'm believing for, I'm just shutting up. I'm not saying anything. Because I know I'm in a fragile situation. I'm in a a very uh, vulnerable position. And that's where the enemy wants me to just start talking. Because this thing has authority. It's the way that I speak. When God gave Adam authority, he gave him words. That's what separates us from the animal, from the lower life forms. And we run around just shooting our mouth off thinking, you know, it doesn't mean anything. It does. What you say is what you get. Praise the Lord. Well, that's just, that's name it and claim it. Yeah, it is. That's exactly what it is. God gave it to us, and I have to claim it. I could throw $100 out here if I had $100 in my pocket. Anybody got a hundred? But I could throw it out here, and whoever claims it, if I just said, there it is, you can have it. Whoever claims it gets the hundred bucks, right? If everybody just sits there and says, gee, I wish you'd bring this over to me. I wish you'd give that to me. But the one that gets up and comes and picks it up, they claimed it. It's theirs. That's what we have to do. We have to claim some stuff and quit being a victim and start being a victor. And the only way we can do that is by by being focused on this word and disciplining ourselves to the place where we don't just say everything that comes into our head. Just because we feel bad, we want everybody to feel bad. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I'm going to talk about, not. this isn't my message, but it's just, you know, just like faith, love, or faith worketh by love, Okay? Strife is the, is the key to unbelief and doubt. So as surely as faith works by love, doubt and unbelief function as a result of strife. Strife is just division. It's contention. And, and here's the thing. If you, when you feel the love of God and you experience, you, you can't hardly help yourself but want to share that. Somehow, some way. I'm not saying you're necessarily going to quote a scripture or whatever, but you just got it. You want to hug somebody. You want to tell them, hey, I love you. You know, God's good. Whatever. And, and, and strife is the same way. Because when you feel, when somebody comes and, tell, and gives you some really ugly story, it'll eat at you and eat at you until you have to feel like you've got to take sides in the story. It's, content, it's called contention. It's called strife. You, you have to choose. Even though it's not your issue. You just heard it. You just got it from somebody else. But you feel compelled to have to take a side. You're in strife. And what is the result? The scripture says where there's strife, there's confusion and every evil work. You say, well, what evil work? I'm not doing anything evil. Think about somebody with malice or hatred. You've, you're, you're a murderer. That's an evil work. You've committed murder. You understand what I'm saying? If we're not 
locked in on this word. And see, you can know the word. Doesn't make you spiritual. Doesn't make you. One with God doesn't mean that you're operating in Christ. It just means you've got some information. So he gave us, if you can go back there again for me, Roberto, Romans 15, 4. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. That we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, when you've got to wait, what, is it, what does it take? It takes patience. Who has patience? Nobody has patience. Nobody wants patience. But it's only through the comfort of the scriptures that you can be patient. So that you can have hope. All right? Now this is going to, like, off the wall here. But go to Numbers chapter 6, 24 through 27. Now the Lord spoke to Aaron and, and Moses and told them, when you're praying, when you're speaking for me to the people, to Israel, my, what he wanted to be his family. He said, here's, here's how I want you to speak to him. Here's how I want you to pray for him. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon thee the children of Israel, and I will bless them. Praise the Lord. Now, in the Hebrew Scripture, God provided a written record of pictures of Jesus or pictures of the Messiah so that the Jewish people would recognize him when he appeared, when he showed up. And even though a lot of the Jews believed that Jesus was the Messiah, the Jewish leadership the establishment rejected him for themselves and for the nation of Israel because that was their authority. They had the ability, and they did. And why? They had this. They had the Torah. They didn't have the, the, the New Covenant, but they had the first five books of, of, of Moses, which is the Torah, and then they uh, subsequently, as their lives, as they lived out their life, they, you know, brought, you had the prophets and the, and the Psalms and, and Proverbs and so on and so forth. So they had the written word. They had words. But the problem is focusing on words instead of the word is religion. Focusing on just the words that are in here, it gets you nothing except a lot of sh guilt and shame and fear and anxiety because it's religious. It's just religion. Just words. But ironically, the Gentiles embraced Jesus. They didn't have the words. They didn't have any written words. They didn't have the scripture. It was all Israel that had it. But they believed the word. When the word showed up, they believed. They were specific about what they believed. Not generic. They believed the word. I think there's a lesson to be learned there, church. We're, we, we haven't, you know, we, we have salvation. The Jews had salvation through their liturgy, you know, through their, through their rituals. But they didn't have God. They had no personal relationship, no real understanding of God whatsoever. It was all in what they did. The Gentiles, who had done absolutely nothing, had no ritual, had no liturgy, had no religious means of doing things, just believed. And they entered into this relationship with God that God always wanted for Israel. He wanted this to be their prayer. It's ours. You can claim it because he has put his name on us. So John, look at John chapter 1. Uh, verse 11 and 12. And I'm not, I'm not trying to be mean, and I hope I'm not coming across that way. But I really do think that sometimes, you know, and I, I'm, I'm not being condescending either, so don't mis, please don't misunderstand me. But just like with kids, y'all got kids, or you've been a kid, you know, so you know how this works. Right? You, you just want to love them and just give and bless and, 
and, and just be kind and, and, and compassionate and understanding and loving and touchy-feely and huggy and all of that stuff. I mean, you want to do it with kids. But there comes a time when their behavior is dangerous. And it ha they have to understand that you're serious about this. Not me, not hate you. Not like you hate them now because they're not. But it's it's like you've got to you've got to get this because your future depends on it. This is this just can't be slipshod and just whatever happens happens. We've got to have it. We've got to have a focus here. We've got to get determined. And I'm not talking about working. I'm talking about focusing and getting our faith where it's supposed to be so that God can do for us what he wants to do. So he says, he came unto his own, his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. That word tra power translates ability almost consistently through the Bible. It translates as power, but it also translates as ability. Amen? So he gave them the ability to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. See, the living word of God needs to be alive in us. Amen. It's not enough just to say, I'm in Christ, or Christ in me. This needs to be in us. This needs to be how we live our lives. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. Well, you don't know what I'm going through. I don't care what you're going through. I mean, I, I, I'm not saying I don't care what you're going through, but it doesn't matter what you're going through. He that's in you is greater than he that's in the world. You have overcome because of that. Yes. So quit saying stuff that doesn't... Agree with the word of God. You're not special. I mean, you're not specially demonically influenced. You're fighting the same temptations, the same garbage that everybody fights. And you need to believe this. Is this not the word of God? Then what are we going to believe? Are we going to continue to go on saying, well, I can't, I can't do that, I can't, no, don't, I, don't tell me that. You won't, don't mean you can't. He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. And you have overcome because he has overcome. So how about learn from these writings, from the word, so that your patience will increase so that you can have confidence and hope in what God has promised you. Because I can guarantee you this, unless you believe that, there isn't any hope. It's all a crapshoot. It's all just a lottery game, amen, where a handful will win and the vast millions of others just spending money. Well, I don't know if you've got the mega millions, fine. I'm with you, praise the Lord. But uh, I'm just saying, it, it doesn't work that way. It isn't that easy. Praise the Lord. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. Stay with me. Now, I didn't just wake up in a bad mood. I went to bed with one, praise the Lord. That's her right there, praise the Lord. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It is God working in you both to will, in other words, to will it, and to do it. What's the will of God? Shouldn't be difficult to figure out. It's right here, and it's in you. That's his will. So his, it's not just he has a will for you, but he will, he'll do what he wills for you. Praise the Lord. Amen. I don't, I, life is, you know, I mean, here's the deal. We, we live in a, it's, it's like a, a facade kind of thing. It's like, this isn't real. You know, Sa Sally told me once, I think it was Sally. <laughs> Praise the Lord. 
that, uh, of course, I'm getting older, so sometimes I forget, but I think she was the one that told me that, you know, you're a lot better looking on the phone. <laughs> so, so uh, amen. You want to see me when I look really good, just give me a call, praise the Lord. And we'll, I'm just saying that we, we, we have a way of looking at things and, and, and declaring it to be real when it isn't real. It's a lie. It's a, it's a deception. So just like the Jewish leadership, just like the establishment, for the most part, the ministry has kept the church in bondage to sin consciousness. I'm not saying they're evil. I'm not saying they're demonic. I'm just saying that's the way they were taught. That's the way they were raised. And so it just perpetuates down to the next generation and the next generation. I know every service I was in as a Pentecostal from the moment I got saved, there was a lot of fear being preached all the time because they thought if we can scare them enough, they'll be good. If we can dangle them over hell often enough, they'll, they'll be so frightened of that that they'll, they'll be good people. In fact, you know, none of us have really been able to completely get away from it. Because it's, it's always out there. I mean, you, you watch Christian TV, and you might get a, a message of grace, and then maybe it's grace, and maybe it's kind of a mixture of, you know, God really loves you, and, but, man, you keep doing that. You know, there's always this nagging in the background that, you know, I, I did this, or I did that, or I thought this, or I said that. And, and so we're never able to really get free, amen, from this sin consciousness. Even if you look in the hymns, you'd find a lot of them are about, they're always putting everything off to the future. Yeah. Won't it be wonderful over there? Yeah. Well, we're here. And God wants it to be wonderful here. Yeah. He wants us to be blessed here. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to sound like I'm mocking the, the old hymns because there's a lot of beautiful songs and, and, and a lot of revelation even in a lot of them. But a lot of them are just scaring people. Just dangling them out there somewhere between heaven and hell. It's a hope for heaven. A hope that God will come through. A hope that God will do something. A hope that things will turn around. A hope that things will be better. And most sermons, i got to tell you, most of them are about sin. About what you need to be doing to get your blessing. What you need to do to get right. What you need to do to, to stay right. And the church has never known absolute freedom from sin consciousness probably since the first century. And I'm telling you, the last day is going to be like the first days. Somewhere we're going to have to get to that mindset and to that way of thinking and that way of living our lives if we're going to see the completion of what God's plan is, amen, for this world. Our God speaks... And he speaks not just to be heard or not just to pass on information. He speaks so that we can begin to know the unknowable. So that we can comprehend the incomprehensible. Praise God. Isaiah 48 and 8. Forty-eight and verse eight, Isaiah. He tells us about people not hearing, and he gives us a kind of a an idea of how that looks. Thou heardest not, yea, thou knewest not, yea, from that time that thine ear was not opened, for I knew that thou wouldest deal very treacherously and was called a transgressor from the womb. Praise the Lord. Thou heardest not, knew not, because you didn't hear, from that time that your ear was not open, I knew you would deal treacherously and was called a transgressor from the womb. But look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 
and verse 9. As it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Praise the Lord. See, we're functioning like Old Testament a lot of times when this is our reality. We feel like we've, 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 we've been treacherous to God, unfaithful to God. And the fact is, we really just aren't hearing God. When you, when, when you hear the word spiritual, see, I, this is one of the things that hangs me up. I, I, we have ways of picturing and imagining in our mind's eye what spiritual is. But when you think of spiritual, you might think, well, just full of God language. You know, you know what I'm saying? You know, talking Christianese or however you want to describe it. You know, things that sound spiritual. Or demonstrative worship. We were talking about, they were talking about what, what went on Friday night. I'm talking, these are not bad characteristics. I'm not saying they're, they're negative. I'm not trying to be negative about it. But I'm just saying... Those are non-signs. Don't get the pitchforks out and start lighting torches. But because they don't prove anything one way or another. Not saying it's bad. I get happy. Hey, you know, I feel goosebumps. I, I'm, I'm more animated at times than other times. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying it doesn't prove anything. I remember one time, we had a lady, she shouted, felt there wasn't a bobby pin left in her head. And this is back in the early 80s when, I mean, it was, you know what it was, the, the beehives and all that stuff. And it was dangerous to be too close to one when they got the going because it was like shrapnel. And she'd shout, and she'd jump, and she'd run. And, she, and, and I, hey, I was doing it right along with her, you know. I was just seeing how, lo- how much it would take to embarrass Sally. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. But I was very demonstrative early on. I mean, I was excited, and I didn't know how to, you know, how to relate or anything else. But this woman, who was the worship, we came in on Sunday, got there a little bit early, and we sat in her pew. Didn't know it was her pew. This is a god awesome truth. You know, you hear preachers talking about it all the time. This is a large church. I mean, so <laughs> we're sitting there. We didn't know. We, we, we hadn't been there long enough to know that they had designated seating. Well, they didn't have, but it was, uh, it was amazing. So we come in, and hey, she didn't make any bones about it. She said, you're in my seat. I mean, just rude, and, you know, we're just young Christians, and, of course, it kind of freaked us out, and we went back and sat down, and I'm kind of stewing over this thing, thinking, oh, who, the, who does she think she is? You know, they don't have dedicated pews here. And, you know, it was kind of going through me. I'm talking about strife, you know. I mean, she, she planted some stuff, and I had it. Now I'm wanting to share it with Sally and anybody else that will listen to me. And here's the amazing thing. Pastor didn't see any of this. He didn't see any of it. He was back in his office, which is out of the sanctuary and down the hallway into another wing of the church, and he didn't see it. And he got up there, and as he began to speak, he said, and you know, this was a new church. The church was about six months old, I think, or so. And uh, he said, you know, when we were taking up offerings and so forth for the finances of building the church, and people would you know, one of the way they do it, they'd buy a pew, you know, a pew costs so much, and they would pay and buy one. And he said, we intentionally didn't put any names, you know, this was purchased by so-and-so or whatever. We, we didn't put any names on it because we knew if we did, somebody think that was their pew. And he said, those pews belong to God. And whoever comes through these doors has a right to set in them if there's nobody already setting in it. Praise the Lord. So, and all of a sudden, I'm feeling justified, and <laughs> hallelujah, the Lord heard me, praise God. But I'm just saying, demonstrative worship doesn't really prove anything. I'm not against it, I'm all, I like it, I'm for it, but I'm just saying, you can't just look at somebody and go, whoa, right. man, I want to get close to them, they got a little rub of that Holy Ghost off on me, it doesn't mean anything, it's a non-sign. It's a good thing for the individual because it blesses them, and it can be a blessing to others. 
I love it when I'm hearing people shouting. and I mean, it inspires me and encourages me. But we're not measuring spirituality by that. Praise the Lord. All right, let's, let's look at uh, verse 13 and 14 here. I think we're still in 1 Corinthians 2, right? We just dropped down to 13 and 14. Which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person is the one who accepts the finished work of the cross. The spiritual person is the one who believes what the Word of God says. Now, I know some people are not demonstrative in the way they worship, but they believe this book, and you can't move them off of it. And God has defined that as spiritual. So... When somebody tells me everything's a mess, my life is a sucks, you know, and all this kind of stuff. Look, I, my immediate, you know, reception says they're carnal. I'm not saying they are always carnal. I'm saying right now they're carnal. Or they wouldn't say that. And a carnal mind is at enmity, enmity with God. In other words, it opposes God. Not, I don't hate God, but when my mind is in, doesn't agree with what his word says, we got a problem. Because he can't talk to me as long as I'm focused on me. As long as I am the one doing the decision making and determining reality and unreality and truth and fiction, then I'm stuck with my results. I'm stuck with my decisions. Praise the Lord. A spiritual person discerns spiritual things. A spiritual person understands spiritual truth. God's word is final. If you don't know this, write it down. God's word is final. I'm going to help you be spiritual. God's word is final. God's word is understandable. God's word is necessary. God's word is enough. In the beginning, we read it, it says, uh, God said, let there be light. That isn't the, the actual writing of it. If you read it, the, the exact word for word translation from the Hebrew, it is God said, light be. And it was. And then we say, look, God is so miraculous. He took nothing and made light. That's not true. He took something, but what he took was invisible. It was there. Light was there. It just wasn't visible. The earth was dark and void with, of, of light and, and no form. And by faith, God's faith, which is how we are to live because we're his children, God just said, light be. And light was. So everything we have need of, it exists. It just doesn't exist in the visible realm. It just doesn't exist here where we're seeing things. And if we let that determine us, we're all going to go back to darkness. We're all going to be uh, messed up and confused and fearful and frightened. But if we operate by faith, we just say, light be. That's how our Father operates. That's how God works. That's why we look at things that are not as though they are. Because they are. They're just not visible. And that's why you have to operate by faith. And you cannot operate by faith if you don't know what you have. If you don't understand what your inheritance is, 
you can't have faith for it. If you don't know what the will of God is, you can't have faith for it. Our battle is wherever or whenever Scripture is threatened. We fight the fight of faith. Just think about it. Whenever you don't believe, whenever you're in unbelief, whenever you're saying life is just a mess, everything's screwed up, I hate it, it's all bad. Well, yes, it is. Life is a mess. Life has a lots of painful things. He told us that. In this world, you'll have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. He that is in you is greater than he that's in the world. Doesn't mean sad things don't happen. Doesn't mean that bad things don't happen. It just means we don't let them define us. And it's hard because when you lose a loved one, when you go through financial difficulty, when you have uh, strife and division in your family, in your home, it's chaotic. And it's hard to focus on the Word of God because the, 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 the sense realm wants to overwhelm you. Why? So that you will not get your promise. So that you won't be delivered. So that you won't get the fulfillment that God has for you, the promise that God has for you. Praise the Lord. We have to believe everything that the Bible says about itself, everything it says about God, and even more important and challenging, what it says about us. And then, because without that, how are you ever going to measure up to the challenge of living accordingly? If you don't believe it, you're not, it's never going to be a reality for you. Romans 1, 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Well, there's your life in a nutshell. Righteousness of God is revealed. Who are we? The righteousness of God. How, how are we revealed? By living by faith. The just shall live by faith. You want to be a witness to the unbeliever? Be faithful. I'm just saying believe what the word of God says. Don't be moved by your circumstance or your situation. Hebrews 10, I'm going to read a, a bit of scripture here. Hebrews 10, 1 through 14. See, we need, to go, we need to go back. We need to be reading this and saying, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Not read it like, you know, can I make that fit into what, pastor so-and-so said, or can I make it fit to what, you know, I learned as a kid in Sunday school? Can I make it fit something? No. Read it and just believe that it's a fact, yeah. that it's the truth. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. The law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. If they could make you perfect, they'd have kept doing, they wouldn't have had to keep doing it, right? Because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. Okay, so those sacrifices that were ongoing couldn't ever deliver you from the consciousness of sin because the very fact that you had to have another sacrifice made you conscious of your sin. I mean, it was counterintuitive. I mean, it was just not, it wouldn't work. That's why Jesus came. So he could do it once and for all to eliminate our sin consciousness. Continue. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. He's talking about God. He didn't get any pleasure out of all those butchered animals. Then said I, 
Jesus, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It's written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, sacrifice an offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. So the law is fulfilled so that Jesus can establish this new covenant. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering, offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now I know we all read that. And it does stir us up. But we don't live that way. Perfecting. You, I'm looking at perfect people. And when you look at one another, you go, wait a minute, he's not looking at her. He can't be looking at him. Yes. God says, you have been perfected forever. Them that are sanctified, them that are set apart, them that are put into the family of God are perfect. What part of that are we not getting? Yes. We're letting this realm that we can see determine who and what we are, therefore what we are capable of doing. And unless we really believe what the Word of God says about us, we'll continue talking the way the world talks in terms of all oh, that bad things coming. Oh, man, here's flu season. It's whatever, and, and it's going to be us too. Or we're going to believe that there's no reason for us to ever fear punishment or judgment for sin because we have been perfected. We are sinless. Oh, you don't know my wife. You don't know my husband. I don't need to know them. They're perfect. They may not act perfect. They may not always say everything perfectly. But according to God, if they are a believer in Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, they are perfect. Man. I, I mean, we need some miracles, church. We need the supernatural. Each of us, our own personal lives, our families, and collectively as the body of Christ, we need the supernatural. If we didn't need it, God wouldn't have come to give it to us. Because we're fighting against principalities and powers and wickedness and evil in high places, amen, that is trying to manipulate and control us and keep us, amen, in subjection to himself and to this world and the systems of this world. Amen. And it is a flat-out lie amen. that we have to be subject to it. Wow. Every time you get a bad report, don't tell anybody else. Just pray and release it. Amen. Just let it go. Because I promise you, strife comes, it wants out. It wants to be shared. It wants, it wants more people involved in strife. Praise God. It wants everybody. But see, love is the same way. You can love your way right out of strife. Praise the Lord. Look at, all right, look at Romans 3 and verse 26. You say, well, you're, you're, you're giving us a lot of stuff to do. That's not, we're not supposed to. Look, I, I'm, not, I'm not giving you a list of do's and don'ts. I'm telling you, God wants you blessed. And there are laws. Just like there are natural laws, there are spiritual laws. And the spiritual law is the law of love. That's the only law that Jesus gave us. The only commandment that he gave us. Love one another as, as you love yourself. Because faith works by love. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness. That he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. He's righteous. He's just. 
and he justifies us because we believe. If, look, if we don't believe that we are perfect in Christ, if we don't believe that we're justified, you can forget about believing for healing. You can forget about believing for financial breakthrough because you don't deserve it. You have no right to it. The reason you have right to it is because he has justified us. He has made us the righteousness of God in Christ. He has given us his name. And so he gives us the prayer from Numbers. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face or his countenance to shine upon you. The Lord lift you up and bless you and put his name on you. Praise God. That church is our reality. God is our righteousness. Jesus is our righteousness. And by the new creation, being born again, born from above, we have become the righteousness of God. You are what he says you are. You can do what he says you can do. You are a partaker of his divine nature. Praise God. In him, we live and move and have our being. God is life itself, real life, true life. Christ is life itself. And we can't live apart from him. Not, not real life, not born again life. You can't live it disconnected. Wherefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, they are become new. And all these things are of God, and we are reconciled to him. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. Now, you might not have grown up to this place. You know what I'm saying? You may not have matured, would be another way of saying it, to this reality. You might not have appreciated it, like most of us. It's just another scripture. We read it and we move on, looking for our special word for the day. But the truth is right there, staring us in the face. We are his workmanship. We were created in Christ Jesus for good works. Works that God ordained long before we ever even existed that we would walk in them. God is inviting us to experience all the fullness that's ours in him. And we keep saying, oh, gosh, I don't deserve that. It's too good. It's too nice. I can't believe you do this for me. And he just keeps trying to give it to us, to bless us. Hebrews 9, 11 through 15. Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of heifers sprinkled the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience 
from dead works to serve the living God. Praise God. I'm looking at people that are perfect. I'm looking at people that are complete in Christ. There's nothing more that needs to be done. That would be a good place to just say, praise the Lord. There isn't anything left for you to do but to believe what he has done. This is called walking by faith. This is the just shall live by faith. The just will believe they are perfect in Christ. You say, well, that's just being arrogant. No. If you're the son of the king, you're the son of the king. You can't help it. Praise the Lord. You're not arrogant. You're just being honest. This is he. This is my reality. And I got all this good stuff, and I can share it. I can bless you. Because my daddy, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He's got all the stuff, and he spoils me rotten. Praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 3. Can you see why the enemy wants strife? Because strife will cause you, I mean, you know, you hear some, somebody say something about somebody else, and you go, oh, my God, that's bad. Then you start making judgments. Well, that was stupid. Can't believe they said that. Can't believe they did that. I'm forcing myself into a decision to side with one side or the other. You know what I'm saying? I might even love the person, but it's so stupid that I can't agree with it. You know, one of the kids might say something, do something. And, God, my Lord, did they, did they really say that, you know? But the more it's there, the more I'm forced to make a decision that I agree with that or I disagree with it. Now I've got contention. Now I've got division. And the enemy just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. It's the way he works. That's how he keeps you from faith. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as, as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. For, you are, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? The word of God is spirit and truth. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Here's a question for you. Romans 8 uh, verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? So here's the question. What then shall we say to these things that God has given us? What do we say to healing? What do we say to deliverance? What do we say to prosperity? What do we say to, to breakthrough? What do we say to revival? What should we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? What are we going to say to these things that God's given us? God is for us. He's our Father. He wants to give us all things. If he gave us Christ, how shall he with Christ not give us all things? Just, let's just forget the religious part of this thing for a minute and just think in logic, just natural thinking. God is for us. He's our Father. He wants to give us all things. How shall he not give to us as a father all that belongs to us as sons and daughters? 
our inheritance. We are God's. He's declared us righteous. That makes us like him so that we can have our inheritance. How will it, how, what, what kind of sense does it make to think that God, who went to the extreme of giving his life so that we could be righteous, so that we could be back into the family, become connected again with God, why would he withhold then healing, deliverance? All this part of the, the, the price that was paid. We are righteous. I'm looking at perfect people. I'm looking at holy people. I'm looking at beautiful people that God says he declares they are my children. And if he has declared that you're his children, how could he, being the perfect father that he is, then withhold from you your inheritance? You understand what I'm saying? I'm not, look, again, I'm, I'm kind of being forceful this morning. I'm not mad. I'm not being hateful. I'm saying, look, like any father would say, my God, that's yours. It belongs to you. Don't let them steal it from you. Don't let the kid down the street take it. Don't let somebody else over here take advantage of you and rip you off. That's yours. I gave it to you. I purchased it. I worked for it. I did everything I had to do to get it so you could have it. Now, you enjoy it. That's what God's saying. I paid the ultimate price so that you could not only be my children, but that you could be blessed with everything that I have. But you got to know that you're my kid. you got to know that I look at you as perfect and righteous and holy, and this stuff belongs to you. And look, here's the deal. The more, you know what gives me pleasure? When kids come home and they go and get in the refrigerator or they just help themselves to this or that or the other thing, and you know, you know what I'm saying? On the one hand, you could think, well, that's a little presumptuous. <laughs> no, that's, that, the kids, it's theirs. It, they, you know, that's mom and dad. They don't feel inhibited. They don't feel, you know, like, oh, can I have a candy bar? I mean, we've got grandkids. Look, it's, their, their name might as well be on the, Deed on the mortgage, you know, I mean, because it's theirs as far as they're concerned. And I wouldn't have it any other way. I want them to feel like, hey, what's Popo's mine? What's, what's Nana's mine? What's Grandpa? What Dad? You know, if it's theirs, it's mine. It belongs to me. I can have it. I can enjoy it. See, that's where we're coming short. We're still standing around at the back door. Uh, I like borrow a cup of milk. When the whole refrigerator is mine. It's all ours. And we're stumbling around in the dark begging and pleading and hoping and praying for something that already belongs to us. But because we don't see ourselves as legitimate, we don't believe that we can have all things. Philippians 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Now, there's another one of those scriptures that we quote, but you can do anything that's necessary to be done because of his ability that's been imparted to you. But if you don't believe it, you'll never experience it. If you're not convinced, you'll always be striving to get to something that's already yours. Psalms 27, verse 1. See, what I'd like is for you to get mad at the devil. I, you know, instead of your spouse, or instead of the boss, instead of the situation or the circumstance, how about let's get mad at him. He's the source of the problem. He is the, he's the one bringing the crap. Amen. And we need to slap him upside the head and send him on his way. And you can do it. 
Jesus said he's waiting for those enemies that he defeated to be under his footstool. And we do that. We do that by believing what Jesus has said, by walking in faith, by living a life that is justified by God. Amen. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I like that song Sarah was singing tonight. Every time she sings it, or this morning, I get blessed. The Lord is my light and my sozo, my wholeness, my everything, my salvation. What do I got to be afraid of? Who shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? That, people, is wisdom. That is ability. He is your ability to use the knowledge of what belongs to you. Praise the Lord. He is your ability to use the knowledge of what belongs to you. Praise God. He's not only your ability, He's your salvation. He's your deliverance. He's your redemption. He's your strength. He's your everything. Nothing shall be impossible to them that believe. See, we, we pray for something, and then we start looking. Praise the Lord. That's not faith. That's doubt. That's like saying, oh, I can tell you all confessions that I have. In fact, I could read them off to you here. But let me just, let me just I'm, I'm not going to do that, but I'll just, this is one. Growths and tumors have no right to my body. They are a thing of the past, for I am delivered from the authority of darkness. Okay? I got a little mole here. Mole here. Hey, look, I got moles everywhere. I'm out in the sun all the time, so I got all kinds of weird stuff going on in my skin. But, you know, you watch TV every once in a while, and the next thing you know, every, every mole, every liver spot, whatever they are, you know, everything that shows up on you that it wasn't there 10 years ago, you go, oh, my God, what's this? So I'm confessing this. It doesn't do me any good to go, there, you know, over here, how's that thing going? No, that's unbelief. I just, you're supposed to forget about it. Amen? Sorry about the, you know, personal Praise the Lord. I could have been a lot more graphic. It would have been ugly, but this is, this is just the normal stuff, okay? <laughs> but I'm just saying, if, we don't, if, if we're not going to believe, what's the point in saying it? What's the point in believing it what, or, or trying to believe it if we're not going to live by it? Yeah. Now, the temptation is, of course, they have no right to my body. Are they gone yet? I mean, that's the natural way because we live by sight. By our senses. The only way for that to be a reality is to forget about it and just declare it done. And that's true of whatever it might be. It might be finances for you. It might be relationships that are askew. It might be any number of other things that it could be. But you can't just go back and then measure that in the natural and say, okay, well, God's just not doing that for me. That, and here's my whole point about it, that puts you in strife with God. It puts you at odds with God. It, it's, cause, it's forcing you to make a decision that is contrary to God's. It's, making you, it's forcing you to make a choice between the truth and what you believe to be. What you can see versus what he has said. Light would never come if he hadn't said light be. It was there. It just wasn't visible. But it would never have come just because everybody went around saying, God, I'm sick of this dark. I'm tired of being in the dark all the time. It's depressing being in the dark. Right? Somebody had to say light be. And it was. And he says we are his offspring. We are his children. We are to function the way he functions. We're supposed to be faith people. We're supposed to be speaking what is not as though it were. Because 
what is not will always be not until somebody says it is. Yes. Until somebody speaks it in here. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Again, be kind to me. I'm not being mean. I'm just, I'm, I'm really sick of watching people be twisted and manipulated and used by the enemy, including me. I'm tired of it. And I want everybody to stand up, look out the window and say, I'm mad as hell. I'm not going to take it anymore. Sorry, I couldn't pass that up. <laughs> but I'm saying we need to have a, you know, we need to have a awakening and just really get ticked off and really start taking our authority and using it in a way that we have been given authority. Praise the Lord. Amen. Ephesians 1, 19 and 20. He, you know, this, the devil, we, we've let him mess with us like the schoolyard bully. Snatching our lunch money, taking our, you know, stuff and, and harassing us and intimidating us and everything else. And, you know, most, in most cases, and in, case, in this case in particular, you give him a good shot right on the end of the nose and he'll leave your stuff alone. He'll go find somebody else to mess with because he knows you're not going to just roll over and let him take you. Amen. That's the way we need to get we need to take this word and throw it right back in his face, amen, and tell him, this is where I stand. This is who I am. This is what I can do, and you have no right messing with my stuff. And I rebuke you and cast you, amen, out of here and all of your imps. Face it, we're not dealing with the devil. Ninety percent of the time we're dealing with some half-baked little imp that is uh, manipulating and twisting and lying and deceiving and, and contorting and using other people. The devil is not, you know, he's one. He's not omnipresent. He's not like God. He can only be one place at a time. So he sends off all these little jerks to hassle with us. Here's the thing. They know who you are. And when you rise up and speak the way you can and the way you should as who you are, they will leave you alone. You know, we're kind of like, you know, Jesus, the, 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 the swine, they, they come up, the, the, all those demons, they said there was legion, that guy had a legions of demons, which was thousands, I guess, and, uh, and Jesus come up to him, they said, oh, whoa, 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 wait, just a minute, don't cast us into the lake of fire or into hell before our time, don't bind us before our time, put us in that herd of pigs, so we don't die. So we can continue on. So Jesus gave him the break. But here's the deal. This is the way we end up being. We say, uh, get the devil out of me, but let me keep the pigs. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, I don't want to deal with the devil, but let me keep the sloth. Let me keep the mess. God's saying, look, you and the, <laughs> talking to the demon, you and the pigs can just go right on over the hill into the ocean and be done with. I'm done with you. See, we, we hang on to our unbelief and our doubt, and, and we're trying to cast out demons, and they say, well, I, uh, Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. Who are you? Well, you know, I think I was born again, you know, in August 18, whatever, and, and I, you know, God's for me. And No, you've got you've to take some authority. You've got to take some, you know, get some grit and stand up to the enemy and tell him you are a liar you have no right to me I I, I, I walk on on you on you demons every single day you have no authority over me you have no power over me and I cast you out and demand that you never show your stinking face again anywhere near here or I'll pray that you be cast into the lake of fire today I demand that you leave my family, that you leave my relationship, that you get out of my finances, that you get out of my faith. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Was the seeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Praise the Lord. Amen. We have yet to grasp the significance of, of that statement. God, who raised Jesus from the dead, is living in you. Whoa. 
God, resurrection power, the God that raised Jesus three days out of a tomb, amen, the same one that raised up Lazarus from the dead, hallelujah, the same one that, that uh, 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 the bones of, a, of an old prophet thrown into a cave come back to life after being in there for a long time, amen, and, and heal and uh, throw a dead body in there and hit the bones and the body comes back to life. That God. That God is living inside of you. Resurrection power. The resurrection, the greatest force in the universe. Greater than the atom. The splitting of the atom. Dwells within you. Man, I don't, I'm, I'm sorry, but look, that's too much for my head. But it's not too much for my spirit. That's a fact. That's the word of God. And if that's a fact, then nothing shall be impossible if you believe. How can it be, amen, if you have resurrection power? If you have life itself, the original life, the only true life dwelling in you, a life that will cause you to never die. And we're wringing our hands about a job? about some relationship that all it would take is just some love on somebody's part to just say, you know what? It's not worth it. I'm going to love you. Let me, ta- let me just say this. I'm getting older. I, I don't even like using my age so much because it, c- it tends to categorize you anymore, but I'm 69. And, you know, I, so that's, it's all relative. You know, if you're 30, that's old, but if you're 60, you're thinking, that ain't so bad, praise the Lord. I mean, 69 won't be so bad, will it? Praise the Lord. If you're 80, 69 was, what? What's he talking about? That kid, what does he know? Amen? But here's what I'm saying. You would think the longer you're in this world, the more comfortable you'd become. Am I right? I mean, wouldn't you, wouldn't, that, that's just logical. The longer I'm here, the more the more it makes sense, the more I'm comfortable with it. The opposite is true. And I can talk to anybody in here, and the older you get, the less comfortable you are here. The less natural it seems. The more chaotic, the more stupid, the more crazy it is, because I'm not getting used to it. I'm getting fed up with it. Amen. Because we know we have a source that is something totally different from this, that we were never of this world. We were just in this world. How about we bring our world to bear? How about we bring our reality to be the reality that we live in? Force the world to make adjustments. Cause them to adapt. I'm sick of it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Man, how about, you know, North Korea set off another whatever they set off over there. So what? I, oh, I, oh, man, what I'd like to say would just be so unspiritual. So I'm not going to say it. But I'll say this. That little twerp over there has no idea with all his little rockets and playthings and all the things he's trying to intimidate people. One touch of resurrection power would make him a new creature in Christ or a dust mite. A dust mite. Amen. So what have I got to fear? What have we to fear? If God is for us, let that little idiot do whatever he wants to do and, and, and uh, thousands of other idiots like him all around the world and a few of them even in our country. I'm not afraid of them. I'm not afraid of their agenda. I'm not afraid of their plan or their purpose because God has a plan. He has a purpose and it will be fulfilled if you can believe. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Praise God. Praise the Lord. I need to calm down a little bit. Somebody be... (laughs) Somebody be slapping the gal at Kentucky Fried Chicken. I'm worked up, praise the Lord. Give me that three-piece meal and get out of my way. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 
Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Praise the Lord. So it's not what we can be, church. It's not what we should be. It's what we are. What we are in Christ. You are. We're not trying to be righteous. Sally said, oh, that's a fact. <laughs> I'm not trying to be righteous. Amen. I am righteous. Don't do me any good to try to be righteous. I just am righteous. We're not trying to be strong. We are strong because God is the strength of our life. How can you not be strong? I'm not trying to be wise. Jesus has been made wisdom to us. Praise the Lord. We are what he says we are. We can do what he says we can do. Matthew 19, verse 26. I'm going to just give you four scriptures real quick here to make the point. Matthew 19, 26. And read this with some conviction. Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Amen. Praise the Lord. Matthew 17, verse 20. And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall shall be impossible unto you. Nothing. Mark eleven twenty four. Now I know this is easy because we're all in here and I'm just screaming. Praise the Lord. But I promise you, you're going to go out those doors and the devil is going to see to it that he can try to steal the word. He's going to come with a situation. He's going to come with a circumstance. He's going to come with something in the natural to cause you to question this. That's what he does. That's why we've got to get convicted. That's why we've got to have conviction when it comes to the truth of God's word. Otherwise, we're like a wave, you know, a ship on the sea. We're just tossed about with every wave, with every situation, with every sense realm thing that comes to us. You get a bad call. The boss uh, has an attitude towards you today. Or, you know, the... This thing you've been hoping for didn't come to pass. And then you go, oh, God, it's just not working. I guess I just haven't been good enough. You just sold yourself down the river. This will help us to deal with patience while we're hoping for that reality. Praise the Lord. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. If you're praying, hoping, that's not a prayer of faith. That's not a productive prayer. That's what I was talking about earlier. That's a plea for sympathy. Oh, God, help me. I don't know what I'm going to do. He, you just negated any help that he could give you. Because he operates on our faith. So you pray it and you believe it when you pray it and let it be. You say, what about doubt? Hey, it isn't doubt until you open your mouth. It's just a thought. It's when you start confessing that you've got a problem. If you, if you feel the need to speak, then speak positive. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. All of our debts are paid. Praise God. Thank you, Lord, that me and my house will serve the Lord. Thank you, Lord, that all of my children will serve the Lord. Even when they're acting like the devil himself. And everything is saying, that'll never happen with that kid. You know what a rebel he is. And you know what she, you know, she just don't want to go along with. Forget that and start declaring what God has said. You and your house shall be saved. Praise God. Uh, Mark 9, 23. And you say, well, I'm just telling my husband this, or I'm just telling my wife. 
Look, they are children of God. It's still, it's still contradicting the word of God no matter who's saying it and no matter who you're saying it to. Just because you're more intimate with that person doesn't mean you can share stupid and think that it won't have an effect. It's a temptation for all of us because when we hear something, we, we want to go, oh, my God, we got to do something to stop this. Instead of saying, I thank my God that he blesses me in every area of my life. I'm so grateful that God has blessed me with children that love him and that will serve him all the days of their life. I'm so thankful, Lord, that you have met all of my needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I don't care what the bank says. I'm not even going to refer to that. That's ignorant. Because, Lord, you own the cattle on a thousand hills. You've told me everything that you have is mine. See, what I'm saying is it takes discipline. Because our mouth wants to run wild with every thought that comes to it. And that's why he tells us, a man that can control his tongue is a man that can get anything from God. Ships, giant ocean liners, are turned about by a little rudder. In comparison to the size of the ship, it's not much, but it'll turn that boat completely around. Horses, a couple thousand pound horse, bit can turn his head, bring him to a stop, even bring him to his knees if you know what you're doing with it. Because that is the most unruly member. Praise the Lord. Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. You each one of you have resurrection ability. Say, this is just, it's, it's too much. Don't say that. Just don't say anything. You don't have to go there, but read Acts 1 and 8 sometime. And you shall receive power. Dunamis. But the, the word is also translated, you shall receive ability after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You have received God's ability. What is that ability? To speak the things that are not as though they are. To speak faith and not doubt. To say, light be. Amen? Amen? You know, we, I'll tell you the truth. When we're having all these storms, and I, pr I prayed, and Sally and I would both, we'd be confessing, no damage will come to our, to our property, to our family, no, no structural damage, you know, just going to be rain here. And it was. And there's been times when, and I really had confidence and, and, and believed that it would be, you know, that that's the way it was. But I can also tell you, at the same time, there's been storms where I've said, I didn't really want to say it out loud because I thought, man, this is going to be a bad storm. And I'm going to look like a complete idiot. I'm rebuking the storm, and then we end up with no roof. Who's going to believe me for prayer the next time? Okay, am I the only one that ever you know, thinks that way? You see what I'm saying? We get to thinking about us instead of thinking about who we are in him. We need to, we need to get bold. We need to get scrappy when it comes to the devil. We need to just get in his face and tell him, I call you son, not because you shine, but because you're mine, praise the Lord. You, you belong under my feet. Amen? Praise God. All right, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. We'll wrap up here. Ephesians 3 and 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Now I can get some pretty crazy thoughts. But I've never been able to think anywhere close 
to what that power in me is capable of. He is able to do exceeding, abundantly, above anything that we could ask or think, according to what? The power that's working in you. Not the power that's off on another solar system somewhere or in some other, uh, you know, reality, but the power that's in you. I, you know, the ability that you have. How long are we going to allow the sense realm, the lower realm, to hold our spirits in bondage, to keep us from being everything that we are and who we are? Spiritual things are as real as material things. In fact, they're actually more real because it's out of the spirit realm that they all come. Spiritual forces are stronger than mental forces. Spiritual forces govern disease. Spiritual forces, spiritual laws, govern natural laws. If that were not so, Jesus couldn't have walked on water. We wouldn't be able to heal. We wouldn't see people healed and delivered. Many times what a healing is is just the body, everything sped up. God created us to be able to heal ourselves. In a lot of cases, that's what it is. Lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And all, all is happening is time. It's, it's time being sped up in that person's body. Satan caused the storm. Jesus calmed the storm. Satan brings an attack. We rebuke the attack. That's what we have. That's our power. That's our authority. That's who we are. As Jesus is, so are you. Jesus said, all power is given unto me. And then he says, go ye therefore. All power is given to him. And he said, I've given you my name. You're my child. So go. Go in that power. Go in that same power. Amen. It belongs to you. Why? Why? Why should we live by the senses when you have revelation knowledge? Why live by what you can see, taste, touch, feel, and smell when you have the supernatural right here? See, the, the Word of God speaks to us just exactly the way He speaks. You want a word from the Lord? Open the Bible. And you'll never be confused. It'll be him speaking. You can't separate him from his word. In the beginning was the word, was the, word. the word was with God, the word was God. You can't separate them. They're the same. They're one and the same. Romans, back to the beginning here, Romans 15 verse 4. For whatsoever things were written for time were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Hebrews 6, verse 17 and 18. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. So, God wanting to show us these heirs, amen, his children, heirs of the promise, the immutability or the unchangingness or the consistency of his counsel. And he confirmed it by an oath. God himself, as though God needed to swear to, by anybody or anything. But he did. He gave an oath. He, he swore by himself that by two immutable things or two unchangeable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie. We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. And we just read what that hope is right here. Praise God. Lay hold, verse 19.
which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, or into the presence of God. The anchor. God himself. He'll keep you in it or through it. Anything that the devil, anything that life, anything that people can throw at you. Church, that's more than hope. Praise God. That's truth. You are the righteousness of God. I'll close with this. Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14. How are you the righteousness of God? Jesus fulfilled all righteousness and imparted it to us or imputed it to us. Right? So in the eyes of God, it's as though we kept the law perfect because Jesus did. He became for us, we became righteous because of him. And because of that, this is our inheritance. It'll come to pass, if you'll hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set on thee, set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. All right, that's, just, that's done. All the commandments were kept, and it was imputed to you. This belongs to you. All these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you shall hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, if you'll believe him. Blessed shall you be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body and the fruit of your ground and the fruit of your cattle and the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause your enemies that rise up against you to be smitten before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before these seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessing upon you in your storehouse and all that thou settlest thy, hand, settlest thy hand to do. And he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth you. The Lord shall establish thee a holy people unto himself as he hath sworn unto thee. If thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. And all people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you, or be in awe of you. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body, in the fruit of thy cattle, in the fruit of thy ground, in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to give thee. The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto thy land in his season, and to bless all the work of thy hand, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. The Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. Thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. If thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them, thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day to the right hand or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. Praise the Lord. Now, that's the truth. And we're staring at facts that don't jive with that. So who are you going to believe? That's the choice. That's where we're at. And to believe, you have to stay close to this. Because this is the thing that will keep you patient while this reality becomes your reality. It's yours right now. But in order for it to manifest, you have to believe it. You have to live by it. The just shall live by faith. Say, well, I've been hearing this stuff all my... I don't... Look. It, either this is true, or we're the biggest fools that ever walked on this planet. And it's not my ego that tells me this is truth. 
It's the hope that he has placed in us. It's called faith. And I'm going to believe it, and I'm going to confess it. And if I act like I'm not listening, it's because I'm not listening. If you're talking negative around me, it gets quiet. Praise the Lord. Not because I'm trying to be rude, not because I'm trying to be super spiritual. It's just because I can't afford to go down that road. There's too much that I need from God to let somebody talk me out of it, including myself. I'm either going to agree with God or I'm going to be mute. Praise the Lord. We need to start disciplining ourselves so that God can really show himself mighty on our behalf. Amen. Amen. Just practice. Practice. Because you know, you'll get chan- you'll have a chance to think and to respond. So practice. If something co- pops out that you don't want to say, you know you shouldn't say, just say, I rebuke that in Jesus' name, and thank God I'm healed, I'm delivered, I'm prospered, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm whole, I'm whatever, whatever your need is. And you'll, you'll get the devil so frustrated and so angry that he'll go pester somebody else for a while. Amen? This is not optional. This isn't like, you know, if your Christianity didn't work, try this. This is it. This is, this is how it's supposed to work. You know, I know it would be great for me just to come out here and go, oh, hallelujah, praise God. God's going to bless you. You're going to receive such a financial increase. You won't be able to believe it. You won't. It'll just be more than you can imagine. Praise the Lord. Now, you say, I didn't feel nothing. You didn't have to feel anything. I, I just basically quoted from the scripture that God wants to do exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or think. Praise the Lord. It's not my problem. It's God's problem. I don't have to worry about it. I'm just agreeing with what God said. Now it's a question. If you want the prophet's reward, you've got to receive what the prophet said. And we go running around thinking, well, if I get this person to pray for me, if I get in the right service, well, this will happen and that. You've got, you've got the word. You've got the greatest evangelist that ever walked the face of this planet. And his name is Jesus. He is the word of God. And all you've got to do is open it up. And when you start speaking, it's just like Jesus was saying. Because he that's in you is greater than he that's in the world. Amen. And it's time we started taking back some stuff so that the world will look to us instead of to the government or instead of to this financial institution or somebody else, but they'll start looking to us. We're supposed to be the head and not the tail. We're supposed to be the lender and not the borrower, above and not beneath, blessed in the storehouse, blessed in the field. Everything we set our hand to is prospered. Multi-million dollar corporations ought to be calling us on the phone saying, hey, could you come over and talk for a little while? We need a consultant. You know what a consultant is? Consultant is somebody who takes something that you think you already know about and causes it to become confusing for you. <laughs> so, so you have to pay them to straighten the mess out. I got to tell you, most preachers, and I, and I got to include myself at times, are more consultants than they are prophets. They're creating more confusion than they are freedom and, and the ability for you to be who you are and what you are in Christ. That's our agenda. That's our role. That's our purpose is to raise people up so that they begin to see themselves the way God has defined them. Not settle for my definition, but settle only for his definition. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. You have a right to every blessing from heaven. Amen. You ought to be walking in joy unspeakable and full of glory. Every day ought to be a day you get out of bed and go, whoo, I just wonder what the Lord's going to do today. How's he going to bless me today? What's, how's he going to do it today? Who's he going to use? How's he going to do it? And if we had that attitude while we're walking through this veil of tears, we'll have a smile on our face. Amen. 
and a good handshake for anybody we meet and the love of God to share with everybody. Amen? And it would be real. And God will be realized. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God.